What's that, Avi? Someone's hacking into the mainframe? What? You gotta start the trace. We, we gotta prevent these Bitcoin maxis. <laughs> I'm gonna get Jack in. <laughs> Quick, hurry. They're almost through. I... I don't know if I can do it, Abby. I don't know if I can do it. You gotta hurry. It's three seconds. They're almost in. I'm doing the counterattack. Okay. All right. I printed the attack. Now I'm just printing the countermeasure. Oh! Got it! You're a genius, man. I never thought you could bypass the encryption like that. That, that was a close one, man. You, you made it. Just in time. Whew. Yeah, these Bitcoin maxis. They're really trying to come after us. They, uh, uh, they're going right in there. Yeah. But you know who's not going in there? Coinbase. 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 Well, welcome everyone to our podcast. Uh, this is our weekly podcast where we talk about Nano. Uh, my name's Donji. I'm the computer hacker. Uh, Avi's my intern. Yeah. <laughs> I just sort of like draw on the whiteboard and say, uh, I, I also look at the clock. So those are my two jobs. Yeah, yeah, he's the, the classic whiteboard drawer. Uh, this week, we got listed not on Coinbase. Actually, we didn't get listed anywhere. We didn't get listed anywhere. It's uh, the 50th day of tweeting at Coinbase, and unfortunately, they have not uh, listed us yet. I mean, you know, it's day 50 of you tweeting at Coinbase, but it's day three years ago from everybody like complaining about it not being on Coinbase. So yeah. yeah. Uh, they're just not there. Not cool. Not cool. Yeah. Uh, same with Gemini now too, actually. Uh, they, uh, a post was made by good old Sanitas Spacora, the champion of uh, Reddit, or at least Nano on Reddit. Uh, on Gemini's own page, uh, own, own subreddit. And the uh, top all time there, uh, no response. So, you know, uh, we'll see if the Winklevi uh, can cave under pressure. Yeah, no, it's, it's unfortunate. When are they gonna learn that? I guess they're just afraid of Nano being great for arbitrage. Uh, yeah, you know, it's really cutting into their business model to some extent. In other news, Mark Cuban, uh, apparently he's aware of Nano because uh, it says he replied to Mira Hurley saying that there are fewer than one transaction per second on Nanocrawler CC. He uh, tried to click through the various nodes, many were not being used. Um, he's basically like judging the app for where it is now, but not where it's going to be for V23. Well, I mean, like... I don't know how much he knows about it, but he did go out of his way to respond to Mira over like the course of a day, uh, or like a 12 hour period. And he looked for, at least Googled Nano Block Explorer and got the first result. So, you know, that's, uh, that's a lot more effort than uh, you would get. And there were potentially quite a few people who are looking at this, so at least for that, it's uh, it's good. And also, there was a news posting, I think, on Coindesk about mm -hmm. uh, this exact tweet string. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, it's not super flattering, but you know. Uh, it's no, no publicity is bad publicity, right? Yeah, and he's basically saying that there's no, like, killer app uh, being used or, or whatever for, for this thing. Uh, it says, as I, our networks are built through applications that get traction. Well, you know, you gotta build these applications, and yeah, like no, that's kind of what we, we have were some built applications. We do, but we don't have users to use our built in built -eat applications. So one thing we were talking about this week was social gambling apps. I mean, last week, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, we weren't talking about last week. I mean, well, yeah. So social gambling apps, I think, are. If you think about it, what crypto is right now with NFTs and the entire market where you're just tweeting, it's essentially like being in Las Vegas, but on Twitter. 
where people are just like flashing bright lights in front of you saying, buy this one, you can get 20 extra turns, buy this one. And it just kind of feels like a whole gambling ecosystem, which is kind of like what makes it fun right now as crypto, because it's not useful in a broader sense yet. Yeah, I mean, at least you can sort of play around with it, like their yeah. uh, chips at a casino, even though like ideally you'd want to have it be used, but like, first things first is making sure everybody has access to the chips, right? Yeah. So the easiest way to do it is probably through this whole like drop slash gambling system. So people will at least have some just from doing this, right? Yeah, and it's like that I feel like uh, with uh, Apollo Nano, this guy who's working on the twi Tweetbot innovations, it's there's now um, Mr. Plan who has on Twitter another we bought nano awards which we went over and it's like you get awarded i think like there could be other gambling games where maybe you have to pay nano to participate in like a drawing for other nano you know yeah like a lottery yeah so nano lottery you know that's one of the apps that it's built it uh well that's not built yet no one has built like a social lottery system it's, uh, it's getting there. I feel like by the time we talk next week, there's going to be like some improvements. Yeah, I want to be able to like put in 20, like $20. Oh, oh. I want to be able to put in $20 and like put on like a gambling thing. Just being like, hey, uh, you can buy tickets to win this $20. It's 0 0.01 nano. And then uh, you have to share this as well to get an extra ticket or something. Yeah. And then maybe get tickets for sharing it but also for buying more tickets and like i don't know or like you give one ticket to whoever you, you shared it to like for free mm -hmm. so so if they want an extra ticket they'll have to buy it and share it so everybody can get like three tickets if they get referred and also get the thing yeah and then it would be great i, I can't wait till they have like mr beast type giveaways where they have like you know users who can win like five grand on like in nano you know for participating in some meme contest or i don't know stuff like that i think could be huge yeah a uh, really good way to build publicity and also just uh, a good use case i guess especially if it's just built into twitter uh then you already have the twitter ecosystem to riff off of without mm. having to worry about also getting people to download your app or go to your site or anything like that yeah um, what else? We uh, have... But there were some games that were being developed, right? Uh, we were seeing on the Nano Currency subreddit. There's at least two like app manufacturers who want to go through and make some uh, like app games for it. Uh, I think we have a link here. Oh yeah, it's uh, this one right here. Pokey. Oh, Pokey and uh, and another one. But yeah, they were very, like, it was weird that two different companies were interested in it within the same week. Yeepaw and Pokey. Yeah. Why? Yeepaw. Yeepaw is a very specific game. Uh, they, like, already have some real life rewards for, for playing their stuff. Uh, so I guess they're, uh, that's their main business model. And... If they are going to use Nano as another thing to distribute as a potential reward, uh, that's definitely something. We really need to capitalize on uh, games, porn, and gambling. The, it's classic. The trifecta. I mean, that's how the internet became the internet, right? Yeah. It, it had gambling, it had porn, and it had games, and that's all you need. Maybe you make a gambling game porn. I'm sure we're right around the corner. From With the... social integration. <laughs> you need to cover all of your bases. Yeah, you can like tweet your mom. Uh, <laughs> tell, them, tell them all no. about all, no. the, all the porn stocks you're buying. And then somehow if you win, you get nano. Exactly. Yeah, Best that's... moms. No. <laughs> This milf, not, milf coin. This is not turning into that kind of podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you brought it up. I'm just saying. Uh, introducing. What is this? 
introducing 10 people to Nano. Talk to them what makes Nano special and great. Awesome. Love to see people uh, doing some grassroots stuff here. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely fun if they're compliant or at least willing to try it out. Uh, there's like a big gap, I guess you could say, between people who are very open to just receiving free Nano and people who are very against it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why anybody would be against it, but you know. So there was this thing this week, and I was just wondering if you could shine some light on what this was. Uh, it was one of the top posts of the week. Well, there's some like context for this, and it's mainly because Binance uh, has like 29.5% of the vote currently. They're, mm -hmm. they're on note. And this is bad because of a update in v22 that removed the uh, minimum quorum requirement and replaced it instead with a 67 percent uh, vote for like final confirmation or 67 percent more than uh, any other fork so this allows you to have like smaller active votes and just not have to worry about needing to get consensus from the entire network in order to approve a transaction but also creates another case where if 33% or more don't vote on a certain transaction, then it will never get confirmed. And that will stall the network and potentially censor transactions. And well, Binance has almost 30% by themselves. So if they get 33%, does this mean that they can just stop all transactions from being done? Mm. So, uh, there were some thoughts in there that sort of went into, oh, well, now we need some way to, like, reassess how we're handling the, uh, the voting. At least as long as the exchanges are going to be big players. Uh, I think the true intent and purpose of uh, a currency like Nano is that you are your own bank, so ideally you'd be in custodianship of your own wallet. But obviously, like a lot of people, are not necessarily uh, ready for that level of responsibility simply because there is a lot of like minor technical things you need to know like oh what how do i store my you don't want to have to be the bank teller and the customer yeah and like some people uh it's not like in their wheelhouse necessarily and mm -hmm. while i do think it's possible for anybody to get familiar with it it's not something that it should be necessarily expected. So there's always going to be custodial solutions, and actually there's there's might be a problem with custodial solutions. We'll talk about that later. But uh, even on the custodial solutions, you need to be able to choose your representative because that's what's securing the network. Yeah. So, and then the idea is that if you if there's like someone like finance, you know, we can all. It has too much power, we can all shift our representatives to other things besides Binance. Yeah, but it's not like anybody's rep is Binance. So Binance themselves oh. are in custodianship of a lot of people's nano. But what they do is they just have an internal ledger of, oh yeah, Donkey has 16 nano, and Navi has 6 nano. Mm -hmm. And when you ask for the money, they just remove it from their account and send it to the, the target address. But while it's not there, just sitting on one of their like hot wallets, right? And they point all those, all of their wallets, like the wallets they have for cold storage and the wallets that they have for like signing normal transactions to the same node. Uh, so there could be a scenario where like the government can censor Nano if they force all exchanges to band together to halt the network. I mean, yeah, they could probably do that right now if they if they wanted to. Uh, they could just say, "Hey, Binance, hey." KuCoin, hey Kraken, mm -hmm. like, or at least just, yeah, they could just say that if you want to, like, operate in our country, uh, you now need to follow these regulations, and here are the regulations, uh, nano, you know, all the notes, you no, know, no more nano transactions, uh, ah. so, yeah, if they want to specifically screw over nano, that's what they would do, and this is kind of, you know, an existential risk, uh, -huh. uh until we get to a point where people are... So in V24, V25, after we have fast transactions, we need to start basically figuring out the solution to this. Well, I mean, yeah, there's another also like legacy problem that is people... Like the, the main point of weakness when it comes to the consensus mechanism is that it's a democracy and it comes with all the trials and tribulations of every democracy. 
which is people don't care enough usually to stay on top of it mm -hmm. and for the most part this manifests as well you know i'm going to set my rep to somebody but what if that rep no longer is running their node or they are or, or they are actively malicious like you need to do your due diligence to who you're going to be saying and so where does this um, idea thought experiment come into play well it's a it's basically a uh, it's the seed of an idea to help make the nano network a bit more trustless. Uh, so right now, you kind of need to either, if you want it to be truly trustless, is you your own rep. So you and I guess your company or anybody who's associated with you directly will just need to be in custodianship of your own money. Uh, if you aren't willing or capable of doing that, you're kind of at a loss where you kind you need to trust somebody you need to trust some third party uh usually this will be like one of the more bigger recommended nodes or somebody like us or not us specifically though i do run a node mm -hmm. uh people like us who have like public personas who you can sort of keep track of so things like that where you'll go through and like know who's who's doing the stuff and why what their intentions are mm -hmm. fundamentally and this is uh something that a lot of bitcoin people always like to bandle about it's like well you know if you're gonna have that be your thing then you're not having like a trustless first layer uh, mm. because now there is some trust implicit you need to, if you're not running a node you need to trust somebody right uh, and running a node while doable for everybody, not every node will vote. Uh, they can verify the transactions, like any node will can, like look at them, but they won't vote in consensus unless you have a thousand nano delegated to you at least. And you won't get your votes rebroadcasted unless you have 0.1% of the network. So what is... Um... So what this does is basically it's an option to automatically redelegate the voting based off of certain criteria that you can set. Okay, so the theory. idea would be like, I choose like a primary and then secondary and tertiary. Uh, like not necessarily. Uh, basically what it will do is, it's, uh, it's a way to like, if you scroll down a little bit, we can discuss it in a bit more detail. But uh, Here? yeah, on the whole, basically what it's doing is, uh, it's trying to evenly distribute the voting weight uh, even if there isn't, like, even if there's certain decisions being made by the users, that would centralize it to a greater degree than is necessary and do this in, like, an automatic way. Uh, they don't necessarily describe the process to do this and what the actual metrics are or whether they'll keep the ability to set your own representative or if you set your representative and then I also saw in the nano forms that there was a, a single transferable vote method uh, though that I don't think will get uh, necessarily added in because Colin did comment on that and mentioned that it would be a very algorithmically expensive process to do for every transaction and it would significantly hinder network performance. But basically what you would be doing is you would need to figure out some way to either distribute the stake evenly across nodes that have a certain level of network performance and then also be able to ensure that all of the nodes that are being distributed to are still choosable by individuals in such a way that you won't end up having like a thousand nodes run by one organization and then they end up getting all the voting power. Because... Can this be a second layer solution? Uh, yeah, so the current like, I guess you could say common thought is yeah, so in the wallets, so the second layer, what you would want to do is have like some representative monitoring thing set up and be like, hey, your current rep is this guy. Uh, they have this much uptime, maybe that you should like pay attention. It's lower than expected or it's low. Or they- Did you have wallets that auto switch? Yeah, you can even have wallets that have like, yeah, so we'll just switch to the lowest percentage representative of this list or just we'll just pick your rep for you and you don't have to the worry about it. The problem is that the wallet could get hacked. Yeah, the wallet could get hacked or the wallet 
like manufacturer could like be not no bueno and if you or they could be like seized by the government and say like hey you need to install this update to send all the voting reps to this thing i mean maybe but the idea is that like even on the uh, and the wallet might just be custodian uh custodial anyway so you may not even have like an account that can but like it would just be their account uh, like as opposed to having like a like right. multi signature account where you and the wallet like share uh -huh. some information or the wallet just sort of acts as like a key recovery system but isn't multi signature or is multi signature but only for the key recovery but you still need to sign all the transactions so because you need to sign the stuff they either need to have some control over your account to do the auto switching or you need to like authorize them on your end to do the other switching. So maybe it will just be something that says, hey, uh, your thing is in the critical zone. You should switch it. Hit this button to switch for your rep. Got it. You uh, know? Choose from this list. You need to switch. This is, these are a list of some good yeah. ones that are up. But even that, like even doing it randomly, while random is like better than malicious, it's not good necessarily like ideally there's also another trade-off here where the less the more the voting weight is centralized into a smaller subset of nodes the, the higher the network performance is uh -huh. because it does take a number of relays to do each confirmation mm -hmm. and the fewer relays you have to do obviously the, the faster it will be this is just like a physical limit uh -huh. So, uh, if you do have a very well decentralized network and we don't have things like sharding or something else put in in order to like reduce the number of nodes that you need to talk to in order to validate a transaction, uh, then the only way to reduce the number of nodes with the current consensus mechanism is to just have the voting weight be so, more centralized. So sharding could help the network become more decentralized? No, kind of. It will it's, enable the... It could push the boundaries of what's possible. For I mean, it, it's complicated. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on here at the uh -huh. same time. You need to get like same with this. How you are redelegating the nodes, uh, redelegating the voting weight in a way that helps uh, improve the network performance and also making sure that things are up to date and also making sure that things are are working out all right. To do this dynamically would would kind of undermine some of the benefits of using the ORV, which is that because there is some level of trust already, you can set it up in a way that works out better. This is closer to something like Algorand, where the staking is kind of done automatically. So you just have Algo in your wallet and you'll, you'll automatically stake to uh, some subset of nodes based off of what they're like, that, what they're doing, what the network conditions are, and you'll receive the staking reward for that. Uh, but since we don't have a staking reward uh, and we don't have some subset of nodes to, to do these things, uh, it's it, it kind of undermines the, the security that you can get from saying, no, this is my node. Nobody else can change who my node is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be this forever. Uh, but you also need to have people who are on top of that and also need to make sure that wallets that are, have seeds that are lost and have a lot of nano or delegated to some node that never existed for the last three years because they can't change the rep physically, uh, that these things don't negatively impact the consensus mechanism or the ability to achieve uh, mm -hmm. like consensus in a fast and, trust, uh, fast and secure way. At least making sure that the network doesn't have any double spend attacks. Well, even if there is just a little bit of trust built into it. So uh, there's a lot of improvements that could be going on here. I don't know if it's necessarily something that needs to be tackled right now, but like as we mentioned earlier, like there are still there's still room for improvement in like uh, many areas of the Nano protocol, and I think that the priorities are known, or at least. Not the priorities, but the problems are now. It's uh, it's this consensus mechanism. It's scaling uh, as well to a certain degree, and like getting things like the sharding and the network topology to reduce how much communication bandwidth there is, because that's really the limiting factor more so than uh, like disk speed or CPU speed, uh, as that will improve TPS. So these two things need to be handled sort of in tandem, and hopefully they'll be a good idea 
uh, <laughs> that can resolve both in a way that's uh, serviceable. But uh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. What about this? Uh, yeah, it is. It is broccoli milk. What, do you, what are your thoughts on how this can help the nano network? Uh, it can make sure that we all have a very good nutritious diet so that all of the developers and all of the users are, are as healthy as they can be. They'll live long, good lives and like meet interesting people and, and spread the word. I think so. Yeah. I think it's going to be a crucial pillar of it. I mean, we really need Colin made you to drink as much of this as possible. <laughs> if uh, if it was possible to like start like a petition and get him on the broccoli milk diet, maybe yeah. maybe we could see significant improvements. I don't know what his like uh, health is like, but he seems to be a fairly fairly healthy individual. Yeah, but we need him to have like super programmer powers. Yeah, we need him yeah. to to yeah. Well, I mean, ideally, like we could all just drink broccoli milk and become super programmers. And then who knows what will happen, you know? We also need to force feed it to Colin LeMay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm that... Uh, I'm not that dead. Uh, they... Below this, there was like an actual broccoli-based milk thing, right? There was like a broccoli powder. You yeah. did. You did agree to drink it. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Broccoli. Um, this was... A broccolate. Not quite broccoli milk, but, you know, a cousin. Uh, it's a brand of broccoli powder with espresso and frothed milk. It came thanks to Australian researchers from the government <laughs> and Hort Innovation, who developed a special type of broccoli powder, which, yeah, if anyone buys this, you know, send some to me, I will drink it with you virtually. I've agreed to it. Yeah, we could uh, we could do a thing, you know. You could taste test live on air. Yeah. Uh, a broccolate. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it will taste like something. Yeah. And um. Oh, oh yeah. Speaking of Colin, uh, <laughs> Colin and George are going to be on this uh, podcast. Not this podcast. This podcast. Not not ours. A different one. <laughs> tokens or coins or whatever you'd like to call them mm. I really believe that and I you know you'd be bored of me saying this but you have to fix a real world problem you know if you are just um you know creating a solution to a problem that doesn't exist there's no real world utility you know it is purely then as a market speculation or a personal gain kind of environment and that's just not where we are um and that's not really our goals I think that the, all these meme coins kind of coming out, they are fun, but it does detract away from actually cryptocurrency was designed to what? back bank to actually help great. people. And I think yeah. due to the huge yeah. mass of cryptocurrencies, we've lost, the sector slightly lost its way in what its purpose is and why we're here and what the huge global potential of cryptocurrency can do to change an individual's lives. Colin, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in in my mind, I'm, I'm fairly certain in my opinion on it, I think it's been a negative thing. I, I think it is a matter of spreading the resources that are out there that are, you know, capable and interested in creating these things. And it's spread them across thousands of coins um, uh, that are out there. So it, it, it makes it hard. I, I think that as time goes on, the number will decrease. But um, that remains to be seen. It hasn't happened yet. I thought I would do it years ago, but I was clearly wrong about that. So they're just basically talking about how the crypto space has just become some deformed uh, it's, uh, creature it's, of what it used to be. Yeah, it's forgotten the face of its father, you know. Uh, it's now all about the moon boys. And also, like, there's a lot of projects in that space, like the DeFi token space, I guess you could say, that uh, are, in a way, uh, I guess you could say, missing the point. Uh, I mean, okay. When people say DeFi, like, what are they talking about? They're talking about things like Hex, you know? Uh, like a token whose sole purpose is to be a financial instrument uh, where you just, like, do a thing and you get money and then you what exchange is, it for fiat. But what is, like, um, YOLO coin, 
ass coin. What are all these weird, obscure coins? Are those considered DeFi projects? No, uh, the DeFi okay. projects are all smart contract type tokens. So, okay. so they're not even like, I wouldn't even say that ERC20 tokens are necessarily like DeFi projects. You need to have like another thing. In there. which so, like, the... financial institutions are really excited about DeFi coins? Well, themselves are trying to be financial institutions. Like even the decentralized exchanges like PancakeSwap or... Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So these are all like contracts that do token swapping uh and that is like a, a decentralized finance application and the tokens themselves uh can be like equity backed things or things that are like debt backed securities that kind of stuff except now you don't need a single institution to issue them you can just sort of issue them yourself get somebody to buy them and then really realize the benefit of having these instruments available to uh, the regular consumer allegedly uh, so that's kind of what they're doing, but also the whole purpose of that is not really to help anyone necessarily. Like, the, there's already a centralized solution for that, and in many ways, having a certain level of regulation in that space is beneficial. Uh, if only because, like, you need somebody to hit somebody with a wrench if things go wrong. And uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to do that when you don't know who they are because they're we a computer. Need, what I was thinking about is right now, the government enforces things like taxes and stuff like that. And I was thinking, like, there could be a future where there's, like, virtual governments. And instead of having, like, a military and police for, like, for the executive branch of the government, of this virtual government, you could have teams of hackers who basically you know, collect taxes and keep their own population safe, you know. I, then... I don't know if the real world institutions transfer over to the internet one to one simply because, well, because of there's know, a different, uh, I guess you could say there's a different network topology on the internet. What happens when like one hacker group just becomes so powerful, they're able to like threaten countries to like blow up their pl power plants and then now all of a sudden they become a virtual nation state and they can protect countries who agree to like get onto their, uh, you know, that could be cool. I don't think that's necessarily how hacking like works. Like if- Avi, I don't know if you saw the beginning of this video, but I am an expert hacker. You're I, right. I know exactly My how, bad. This, I forgot. how this plays out. Uh, but like, uh, basically the, the issue with that is that if you are able to just do that, like you're also breaking the mathematics, right? That we are relying upon to secure these things. Like if you can just brute force it without, like not brute force it, brute force, but if you can just break the math in order to achieve these ends, then you're, you're breaking a lot of things. Like everything's built on the same math. So like every option is the nuclear option. Uh, as soon as you become one of these hacker groups that can like, oh yeah, we can just break any security or any encryption and just like go through and like hack all your power plants. Well, see, most of the most of the hacking attacks are actually on the weakest link, which is always going to be the human person who needs to go the into the office. The passwords and post-its. Yeah, those guys. Yeah. So, or like talk to people and like explain, oh yeah, here's our infrastructure stack, and like I always do updates on Sunday mornings at three fifteen. <laughs> And like, then you know that, well, it's going to be down at 3.15, so at 3.16. So you just like, uh, you know, hack their browser and do like a git push right before they're about to... Yeah, or, or like not even that, but just like, since you know what they're using and when it's going to be updated and to which version it is, if you are aware that there is an outstanding vulnerability in that thing ahead of time, you probably schedule it even before they know. The, What's the your background system? in hacking? I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's basically the uh, the main format. It's not about like just going in and scanning the ports and then oh, I found the found the vulnerability. I'm going in and then you you plug in your keyboard. I, I want people. I want there to be like games that turn into nation states. That like I want this to be like a thing where you have virtual countries. I mean, we all love like the cyberpunk genre. You know, Shadowrun, fun game. But, uh, you know, you can't, you can't really, it doesn't transfer over, like, there's a, that's movie stuff, man. Yeah. Basil Mayhew had, uh, interesting posts. Uh, what is this? 
Well, it's another. another if I, w- cool if I, I could be rich in the world where Bitcoin is successful, and for me, that's not as exciting a world as uh, the one where, like, Nano is successful, for example. If they're mutually exclusive, which I don't think they are, but Max might say they were. But um, because the world in which Nano is successful is one where, like, people can actually use this cryptocurrency, like vast numbers of people can use it. Yeah. And so when I back Nano, I'm also backing the world that is worth putting all of this effort into because, you know, I could just not worry about crypto. And, And over this many years that it's been, I spent significant periods of time not thinking about crypto at all. And, um you know, not, you know, not looking after wallets that I should have looked after <laughs> um, and things like that. Not checking the price um, every five minutes. Yeah, it, it's like it, take, it takes up a lot of our time if we let it. Um, so we should care what it's going to do. And is it, you know, we can't just think, oh, cryptocurrency is going to follow a certain path anyway. And therefore, we just have to think about our position within that. You know, that's, I don't, I reject that. So anyways, he's talking about what's been on everyone's mind in the Nano community, which is, it's actually useful, so. I mean, yeah, so that's also kind of what George and uh, Colin were getting at in the earlier podcast, and uh, it's going to be next week, so I think, uh, I'm sure everybody who's listening to us will also listen to that for obvious reasons. But the idea is that the current crypto space is like full of all these projects that are just there to make money off of the fiat exchange uh and really like what we or what the original purpose of crypto and bitcoin in general i guess or bitcoin in specific was was to be the peer-to-peer exchange with no additional middleman you just sort of just used it to help improve your existence you know you're you're sending money to people and you don't need to worry about, oh, yeah, I don't have like good credit to start this bank, or I don't have the minimum amount of collateral, or there's no service providers who want to give me like any amount of uh, like account size simply because I'm not going to have enough money because I live in uh, some impoverished region or whatever. Uh, because these reasons are like underserved, and there's also issues that come across from like needing to deal with other sorts of groups. Uh, it becomes more of a, a challenge for them to get involved in the global financial system and these lack of opportunities basically lead to even further uh, like further being divorced from the normal wealth building operations that you can do. So it's something that's deflationary and also easy to use like for example Nano uh, would be able to help out by just helping you build that like helping you realize the value from the things that you're already doing without having to worry about like minimum balances or anything as long and as you also without having to worry about your second layer uh, service providers being controlled by the government uh well yeah i mean it's a good good segue into the stuff uh so there was a lot of talk earlier about the uh financial action task force or yeah uh, the FATF, uh, which is financial asset task, financial asset task force. Yeah, but uh, they're basically a multi-governmental, like non-profit organization that helps set standards to do things to counteract specifically money laundering. Uh, alleg- well, not allegedly. They they do make regulations to help counteract money laundering as well as like terrorist financing, quote unquote. Uh-huh. So uh, basically they are going to be releasing a new revised set of standards on the 30th of june uh for that's like in a week uh for reference and a lot of people may be significantly impacted by this because their main primary focus is on virtual asset service providers so these are exchanges but also like anything that converts uh fiat to to crypto or any crypto to crypto exchange or any decentralized exchange like PancakeSwap or Uniswap or whatever that convert one type of token to another type of token. And, and just to explain the tabs real quick, this is the previous one. This is like the OG version, the 12 month. Um, yeah, that's from last year. This is from last year. And then this one 
it's, it's a the, draft. It's a draft for the updated one, and in the yeah. draft, they there's this Reddit post that kind of summarizes um, what the draft is going over. Yeah. Which is. Oh, which is basically that they want to have they based off of what the uh, feedback from the last uh, standards that they issued. Uh, most of the countries, or more than half of the 121 countries, have implemented some version of their standards already for keeping track of it. But basically what they want to do is to extend it out to be a bit more robust for these virtual asset service providers, uh, as well as the organizations that offer custodial wallet solutions, uh, which are also virtual asset service providers. So they all qualify under that umbrella. Uh, and in fact, anything that can be used as something that you have like a multi-signature wallet where there's another person on the other side that needs to like sign things on that transaction, which is exactly how the Lightning Network works. Uh, all of these things need to have more stringent KYC or know your customer regulations so you can keep track of where so the just, money is going Just to help to. the audience here, the KYC know your audience thing is implemented in the United States, but not in Europe. And what that means, basically, correct me if I'm wrong, is that in the United States, you have to, if you want to buy Nano, for example, you have to go to an exchange, give them your identity, get verified as a real person, you know, do a whole bunch of stuff, answer emails, and then you can finally get approved to be able to purchase. And then they track things like your taxes and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know if it's not implemented in Europe. It's just different in Europe. Uh, in the U.S., which is the only thing that I have experience and can speak to, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it, you need to like give a lot of documentation about who you are and like where you live and what your previous like bank statements were or like a bill that you paid to your utility company. Like, it's it's a long and intensive process. It takes a lot of like information. And it usually takes a, a little while uh, to, to get processed in the first place. And all of this stuff is there so that they can track who's getting money from the system. And part of this thing is to also limit the number of peer-to-peer -peer transactions or transactions to just wallet IDs. To out that are part tax? No. That are, no, it's not about taxes. It's, oh. it's about like knowing who's sending who to what at all times. That is their primary goal. Uh, and they are willing to impact all aspects of this uh, in order to achieve that goal because obviously uh, they are looking at it from like a money laundering terrorist financing angle. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of like currently like there's a lot of ransomware made by hackers who are like, well, we got this thing running on your computer. We've encrypted all your files. Send us like 10 Bitcoin. There was a meat factory, for example, that had like all their operations shut down. They had to pay $5 million just to unlock it. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of stuff is the stuff that these people want to be able to avoid. They want to be able That's to... good. I mean, yeah. So there is room for, like, things. Like, there's actual harm that come out of it. Because now, uh, if they if they do have all this KYC and AML stuff, and they prevent you from making peer-to-peer -peer transactions, and they go through and make sure that if you are using a custodial solution as a wallet, you can only send to other consodial solutions that have the same uh, KYC setup, you can basically keep track of everything uh, in the same way that yeah, the normal banking they system does They just want you to that. use the dollar. Well, yeah, they also want you to use the dollar. And they're actually very, they're very skeptical on stable coins. They, they always say so-called stable coins whenever they mention them and they put the quotes. So, you know, they're, they're not huge fans of uh, non-things. They just basically want to go through we should cover that next episode by the way uh tether and stuff like that oh yeah there's a lot of controversy surrounding yeah. how much backing tether actually has for all of its uh you know coins yeah. but uh yeah so anyways uh basically what the underlying thing to get from this is that uh they aren't necessarily going after peer-to-peer -peer currencies directly but they are going after anything that you would use to work with a peer-to-peer -peer currency. Uh, even if you aren't doing it, as long as you're doing it through some service. And they want to make sure that all the service providers, all the companies that are helping you send transactions, that these companies have very stringent regulations about who they can operate with and what they need to know about their customers uh, so that they can keep track of how the money is being sent. 
So for things like strike or you know other things that are on the lightning network, yeah, this is going to be something that might affect their ability to offer payment solutions because they do qualify as a virtual asset service provider. Uh, all of these DeFi platforms that are decentralized exchanges uh, that help you transfer one token to another token through some like process, these are also going to be potentially negatively impacted. Uh, Coinbase and like other solutions that want to like offer different financial assets, uh, they may not be able to offer all of them simply because some of them may not be very compliant or they wouldn't be able to like go through and set them so up. So they're really trying to ban Monero, essentially. Well, they're not trying to ban Monero. They're not like fans of Monero, but Monero, you can send things on layer one. So they can't like get rid of it, get rid of it. Because uh -huh. you don't need a service provider. You just need the Monero software. So you'll never be able to kill monero that's actually kind of interesting and you wouldn't be able to kill bitcoin either or like any of these other things to some extent you'll yeah. just be able you it just will not become easily widespread yeah because yeah. it will be a crime to use it but like monero will still be used forever uh, it's not gonna like stop it's like the best privacy coin so it's going to be used for anything that you'd want private like you know all these illicit operations and if you're going to commit one crime you might as well commit two right mm -hmm. and then we also um have this request to list nano oh yeah on gemini, gemini. yeah uh the winklevi have uh, I'm not sure if we have the video on tap, and I'm actually 100% sure we don't have the video on tap, but they were asked like in a, I think it was some sort of video chat application, Periscope, something like that. They were asked basically to, to list Nano uh, earlier, and they were like, Nano, what's that? And this was back in like 2018. Oh. So this was like after the bull run, if I recall correctly, but like when Nano was newer. Uh, or like right after the name change. Uh, actually, I'm not too sure on the dates. Don't quote me. But but yeah, they uh, they apparently don't know about Nano and they they look into it, quote unquote. But uh, you know, now on the subreddit, uh, it's highly highly rated uh, as like a top top listed top all time on their subreddit. Actually, it's uh, a. <laughs> So just like Coinbase, where we're also top all time, if I recall correctly. Uh, Dude, these Bitcoin maxes, maxis are like uh, the new... Uh... I don't think it's the Bitcoin maxis in general when it comes to these exchanges. Uh, they have a vested interest in being these uh, virtual asset service providers, you know? And Nano is good enough to not require those to function. In fact, actually, as we were talking about earlier with Binance, it functions better without it. it. It functions. Not having them is better for the network's health than having them, right? Because ideally, everybody would need to set their own representatives, somebody uh -huh. they trust. And while it may be these exchanges, like it needs to be an option for everybody to pick. And for like all these exchanges other than I guess Exodus, you're not allowed to do that because you're not in control of the key for uh -huh. the for your wallet. So ideally all of Nano's custodial solutions will be like something where you have the key and they have like the necessary keys to do key recovery, but not much else. Uh, but yeah, anyways, uh, it's like a huge, it's, they're not gonna ever list it, I'm telling you. Uh, they, they have a vested interest to, to not do that because they want to offer free instant transactions using your crypto to the other services. They want to be banks and you don't get to be a bank. In fact, I think Gemini is a bank, uh, registered as a bank in, in New York. And that's why they can offer uh, registered as a bank. Yeah, they're registered as a bank. So uh, basically, they want to fill that role in this new economic system, quote unquote which is defeating the point again, in a way, because the whole idea was to not have to rely on these centralized institutions to send money to each other. But if you promote solutions that do do that, then you're kind of like now stuck with them again. And it's not necessarily beneficial to the cause 
if you care about the cost. If you care about making money, this is the easiest way because like this is how you get widespread adoption. So if you already have a whole bunch of this deflationary asset and now it's used as something that can be uh, backing to normal financial operations and like the normal economy, uh, then yeah, it's great. You can make a lot of money and then you can convert that back into fiat and buy your groceries. But I feel like most of the people in the nano community want to buy those groceries with nano, you know? They want to go down to the, the local broccolate store, pick up a broccolate. delicious, <laughs> a delicious broccolate, sip it down, like toss them some nano uh, on the side, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and not just have to deal with like, oh yeah, hold on, let me use my banking card uh, and like send you this stuff. And then what it does is it just converts from fiat from the crypto backed information. You have to like be fully registered and like have a full account and everything. It just is more of a hassle or it's not really a hassle. It's just more, it's just less decentralized. It's just, it's just not what is interesting about crypto is that you can, you can have the efficiency of just doing transactions as needed on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without there needing to be like a bunch of centralized coordinators to make sure that the network or make sure that all the transactions are being go going through successfully and while this does potentially offer a risk to the existing like financial infrastructure uh like i guess we just need to decide as a global society what how much risk is acceptable and what kind of future we want to build uh, and that's something that I feel like really needs to be put to the fore of mm. the, the thing. And we need to like have less moon boys. But, you know, that's just me. Well, yeah, uh, we should probably wrap it up. Uh, I did notice at the end right now that you know, there's a delay in the video. Sorry, people watching. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, if we don't have problems, it wouldn't be this podcast. So we need to have at least one per episode for all time. Uh, if we get this down to like a science and we're very good at it, we'll we'll go through and make some issue. We'll like add yeah. some vibration to the video. It's basically like our third co-host. It's just, you know, technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's Donji, me and technical difficulties. It's great. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, if you guys like this episode, please like and subscribe. Um, especially if you like the technical difficulties, give that, um, hit the bell. <laughs> and if you want to see more technical difficulties, see... subscribe. And then also like leave a comment telling us to, to put more in. Cause we can, we can always put in like last effort to make it good. Yeah. Yeah. We could start, you know, adding some like glitch effects or I don't know. We could like pay a hacker to actually actively hack us as we're doing this, you know? Yeah, yeah. The, there's really infinite ways to have technical difficulties. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's like we could be the premier technical difficulty podcast. Yeah, I mean, as a hacker, you know, I, I, I think I could figure this out. Hopefully, one day. Uh, yeah. I mean, hopefully. Yeah, Maybe. but you know, hackers cobble together code, so. I don't know. It's maybe not my wheelhouse house to do uh, fully documented code. You know, that's just how it is. Anyways, uh, you know, have a good, good one. And uh, I think this episode's going up within like a couple of days of the last one. So I guess this week is double week. Nice. All right. I'll catch you guys later. That was like way delayed. I was like counting the seconds between that wave and then. <laughs>